in the name of God who created us, who loves us, and who sets us free. Amen. It is a great joy and privilege for me to be with you today. I visited this congregation and this building a number of times when my husband Tom Holliday served here as interim rector um, some years ago now. I think it was 2007 um, was, was when he was here. It is a thrill for me to be back here now with you in this capacity as one of your bishops. I've had an unusual and brand new experience for me this month. For the first time in my life, I was called up for jury duty. And I've been called up twice before, actually, but I wasn't actually living in the county or the city where I was called because I had recently moved. This time they caught me, though. <laughs> so a week ago Friday, I had my first experience of going into the courtroom and being sworn in and then having the judge, as we were standing in the jury box, give a talk. And he said, you know what's going to happen here today is nothing like what you see on TV. He said, there's not going to be any DNA evidence. There's not going to be any fingerprint evidence that's going to give you an incontrovertible answer. And the defendant is not going to speak. And he said, are any of you going to have a problem with that? And some people raise their hands and say, I, you know, how do you, how do you make a decision if there's no scientific proof? And the judge said, you need to listen. And then make the best decision you can based on what you hear. There is a huge gap between what TV programs show where there's always some kind of miraculous last moment piece of evidence and the whole thing happens in an hour. <laughs> Big gap between that and the reality of our real legal system. I learned about that a bit firsthand as it took four hours for them to select the jury. Not surprisingly, the prosecutor dismissed me. I was not chosen as a juror. <laughs> the assumption about an Episcopal bishop would be that I would be too merciful, I'm sure. <laughs> so when the jury was finally selected, I was able to leave. As much as there's a gap between what TV says about the law and what our legal system says about how it actually works, there's an even bigger gap between the way we look at the law today and the way people looked at the law in Jesus' time. I think we Americans have an ambiguous relationship with the law at best. We respect the law. We want the law to be there when it's on our side. When we have experiences, though, that suggest that the laws maybe are not just, or when we're going to be the one who's hurt by enforcement of the law, then maybe we're not so sure that the law is a good thing. In Jesus' day, the scribes, the lawyers, and the Pharisees believed that the law was inviolable because it was a gift from God. That God had given the law to Moses on Mount Sinai through Moses to all of the people. And they believed that the law, as a gift from God, was a sign of God's love. That God loves God's creation so much that God wants us to live in right relationship with God and others. That God wants to give us every chance possible to live in the right way. And so the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders in Jesus' time believed that the law was a sign of God's love and it was incontrovertible. But that doesn't mean they didn't argue about the law. They did all the time. They didn't believe that you could throw anything out or add anything to it. Their favorite argument, and we have recordings of some of these arguments, 
from the ancient world. Their favorite argument was over the question of which law is the most important. And they could sit for hours, days, weeks, months, and they did, arguing about which law was the most important. Because in the Old Testament, there are not Ten Commandments. We sometimes talk about the law as being Ten Commandments, but there aren't ten. There are 613. 613 laws in the books of the law of the Old Testament. And those laws are divided into different categories. 248 of those laws are positive precepts. You shall honor your father and mother. You shall keep the Sabbath day holy. 365 of them are negative precepts because they're put in negative language. You shall not commit murder. You shall not steal. So they're divided into positive and negative purely because of the grammatical language, not that one's more important than the other. And then in addition to that, those laws are divided into heavy and light. The heavy laws are the ones that have to do with the relationship between people and God. The light laws are the ones that have to do with the relationship between people and other people. And there, there is a judgment that the heavy laws, the ones about God, are far, far more important than the laws about how we deal with other people. So 613 laws divided into two categories, further divided into two more. It was a complicated system. No wonder the lawyers spent a lot of time arguing about what was the most important law of all. On the day we heard about it in the gospel, the lawyers and the Pharisees invited Jesus into that conversation and asked him, what law is most important? Except as the gospel story tells us, they really weren't inviting him into conversation. They really weren't interested in his voice being part of the ongoing conversation. They said it to test him. They were trying to trap him. As we've seen in gospel readings week after week now, they're after Jesus to try to trap him. Jesus knows it's a trap. But he, uh, he, he answers honestly and openly. He actually engages and answers the question. And he starts by saying, the first law is this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. The Pharisees, the lawyers, would have heard that and thought, yep, that's probably what most of them would say is the most important law. In fact, that is called the Shema, the Jewish declaration of faith. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. But Jesus, being Jesus, and looking at the world differently from the way the scribes and Pharisees and lawyers did, he didn't leave it at that with that very safe and correct answer. Instead, he said, and the second is like it. Well, already he started to scandalize the Pharisees and the scribes and the lawyers because they said, which law, which one? is the most important. And now he's saying, and the second is like it. Already he's going far beyond what they were thinking. And he quotes Leviticus. And he says, the second is equally important. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, on these two laws, all of the books of the law and all of the books of the prophet depend Everything depends on these two. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, we're used to hearing those words. So it's hard for us even to imagine how much of a scandal it was when Jesus said those words. It was scandalous. Because what Jesus had done 
is to equate a light law, a law about how people relate with each other, to a heavy law, a law about how we're supposed to be in relationship with God. As far as we know from the Jewish literature of the ancient world, no one had ever done that before. Jesus was doing something radically new, and it scandalized those who heard what he had said. Scandalized them so much that the gospel reading says from that point on, they didn't try to trap Jesus anymore. And they didn't try to trap him anymore because they had all the evidence they needed that he was a false teacher, that he was leading the people astray. They stopped trying to trap him and began in earnest looking for a way to kill him. It's hard for us, whose faith is based on love God and love your neighbor as yourself, to imagine how scandalous those words were when Jesus said them, and how those words were part of what got him killed, and of course led to the rest of the story and the life that we know out of his crucifixion and resurrection. If we really think about those words, sometimes they can be shocking to us, too. Because sometimes American Christianity is very personal. If we watch much Christianity, much TV, uh, much worship on TV, especially, we see an American brand of Christianity that's very personal and individual focused on my relationship with Jesus. Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. My journey to get to heaven. But there's at least a wide branch of, of Christianity in America that's about me and God. And not so much about me and other people. The fact is, though, that these scandalous teachings of Jesus are the basis of everything in our faith, that two kinds of spirituality come together in our life as Christians. There is our relationship with God, our personal and our communal relationship with God, what we might call a vertical spirituality, connecting me, connecting us with God. But we also know from our Christian life that we also live with a horizontal spirituality, the relationship between me, between us, and between other people, other Christians, other people of other religions, people around the world. And when the vertical and the horizontal come together, what do we have? We have the cross that we strive in Jesus' name to live our faith at that intersection between our relationship with God and our relationship with others. Living at that intersection took Jesus to the cross where he was brutally executed. It takes us to the cross. It takes us to the place of challenge and of sacrifice and of self-giving for the sake of the world. You in this congregation, as I've seen you from afar for a number of years and now as I see you up front, it seems to me that, that you know something about living at that intersection of the cross. All those years ago, it was probably 2007, when I first came to this building and walked through with my husband, Tom, who was interim. I was amazed. I was astounded. We would walk through one level and these beautiful rooms with the stone and the wood, and yes, need of repairs, but beautiful rooms, one after another after another. And then we'd go either up or down a flight of steps. And there were more rooms, one after another after another, and then another layer, another flight, and more rooms. And the preschool was here using a 
portion of the building. But there were whole sections of this building that lay completely empty. And I was astounded by the great gift and the great resource you have in this place that you inherited and wondered, what were you going to do? What was the Holy Spirit going to do in this place for you? Well, today when I came, I on purpose parked in the back, in the parking lot, and came through the school door and walked through every level. I wish I could be here when the kids were here. But there's no emptiness in this building. There is fullness of life. I wondered if I turned myself off. <laughs> Did I? No? No, it's just off. So I saw life, amazing, abundant life this morning as I walked through. What you are doing with the school is living at that intersection of relationship with God and others. Your goal for the preschool, as I understand it, to serve not only those who are coming now, but to reach out into the whole county to children who are underserved, to those children who are not ready to go into kindergarten, and to give them a jump, a start on life, so that you're serving not only children here, but have as a vision serving children beyond these walls. That's living at the intersection. You give generously to the Diocese of Virginia. Now thank you for that gift. Because that tithe of your income to the wider church connects us with each other. It means that you are doing ministry in hands-on kinds of ways, in far-flung far places like Congo, like Sudan, Honduras, all kinds of countries in Central America, in Korea, in Taiwan. And we, as the Diocese of Virginia, the rest of us, the other 80,000 Episcopalians, are a part of your ministries here because we're connected with each other, because you choose to live at that place of intersection. You're striving, as I understand it, to identify more and more what hands-on outreach would look like by asking, what are the needs in Fauquier County that you have the gifts and skills to help meet? You're looking for that place where your great resources can intersect with the great needs of others. As I see you, you are living in that place of intersection between love of God and love of others. It surely brings you to a place of challenge. And you know what those challenges are far better than I do. It surely brings you to places of sacrifice because the cross is always a place of sacrifice. As you see the challenges and the sacrifices of the life of love that you have chosen, always remember that God brings resurrection life out of those sacrifices. Yes, Jesus died on that cross, but God raised him to new life. And God raises every one of our little deaths and our sacrifices and our sufferings 